This morning's scripture reading will be from 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we are asking anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Amen. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears us. Thank you, Tori. I should say Troy, huh? Thank you, Troy. This is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let's be glad in it. In June of this year, our shepherds commissioned a preacher selection committee to locate, to investigate, and to interview potential candidates whom we would then place before our shepherds for their interview, for their invitation, and eventually their selection. This has been a huge task. I'm speaking here today, but the first thing I would like for you to know that there are 11 other spirit-filled men and women and their supportive families who are standing here with me. From the very beginning, our committee was absolutely determined that this whole process would be one that needed to be just completely immersed in prayer. Today, we want to continue to engage and encourage this congregation in that immersion, to pray for our church, to pray for our shepherds, to pray for the committee, and to pray for the man whom God is preparing for us even right now. Over these months, we've initiated our 10, 2, and 4 prayer plan. You'll see those signs on our, most of our doors. And yes, it comes from a Dr. Pepper bottle from 10, 2, and 4, three times a day. What we want to do is we want to use those three times a day, regardless of where we are, in a car, shopping, at home, at work, playing golf, whatever, three times a day. We want to unite our voices with one another and raise our voices to the throne of grace. All together, let's pray for this whole process. We've established a, a weekly prayer plan where you can get this sheet of paper. It's over in, in our prayer room. And you can be guided in your thoughts over a whole week of prayer. And then when you get to the bottom of that week, guess what? You can start over again. I've talked to the prayer room that's in the hallway just across from our administrative offices. And we have also established a prayer journal. I'm going to say more about that in just a minute. But it's located over by our family picture tree over here in the lobby. This is now the second of four planned assemblies that are going to be emphasizing prayer. Our third will be when we enter our invitation phase. And the last one is going to be when we're done, when we will have a time of prayer in the presence of our next preacher, in the presence of our former preacher. Perhaps Greg Anderson and his family will be able to join us along with others. And it's a time to give thanks and glory to our God for what he has done through us. So that's what's coming. Today, we just need to ask our God's guidance. Psalm 122 begins, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. A number of years ago, there was a country and Western singer 
whose name was Alan Jackson, who did a song that was entitled, The Older I Get. You think I can relate? Some of the words of that song were, the older I get, the longer I pray. I don't know why. I guess I've just got more to say. So I'm glad that we have this special time to pray. I am glad any time that we are joined by our Hispanic brothers and sisters. I'm glad that you're joining us online. And I'm especially glad, I am especially grateful for a wonderful group of our shepherds who have had the vision to call us again to prayer. We need, we ask for a special place in your prayers. Please pray for the man whom God has chosen for this work. We don't know his name yet, but God does. If you are using our prayer room, good. If you're writing down what you're praying about and other words of encouragement in the journal, that's even better. Please remember what we're going to do with this journal. We are going to give that to the man and of course his whole family upon his arrival. Now stop just a second, put yourself in his shoes. How would you feel if you received that journal and it was full of, of encouraging comments, words of thanksgiving? How would that make you feel about the Mesa congregation? I think I would look over at my wife and say, honey, the Mesa church is where we need to be. Look what these people have written about us. Look what they've done even before they knew our name. That's the way we want our new preacher to feel. Wouldn't that make you feel great? Amen. Who was it that said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? Today's call to prayer is going to follow the same pattern as our first one in that there's going to be an area of devotion, an area of focus announced. There's going to be a scripture reading. There's going to be devotional thoughts. There's going to be a time of silent prayer. And then one of our shepherds is going to lead our congregation in prayer. This pattern is going to repeat itself four times. But we ask you, please don't just listen. Make these thoughts your own. Bring them home and let them help you grow in the Lord. Remember where we left off last time? What do you see? Yeah, a lot of you answered correctly. You see a football. We see a lot of those this time of year, don't we? But I thought, what a perfect reminder of what our prayer life should look like. Because whatever our concern, whatever our need, if we sew it up at both ends and all around with prayer, there's just no way it can come apart in the middle. As we begin... Let's pray. Let's pray together. May the words of our mouths, and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable, be acceptable to you, our Lord, our God. Blessed be you, Father. You are sovereign in heaven and on earth. Who are you selecting? Who are you calling to serve this congregation? Show us your choice. 
For we ask these things by the authority of Christ. Amen. I mentioned our preacher selection committee earlier. God is working mightily among us. So focus area number one is the hand of the Almighty is upon us. From Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they comfort me. This psalm speaks about the big needs that all of us have. It shows us that the more that we put in God's hands, the more we see God's hands in everything. We see God's hand among us. If there is anything I regret about being a part of our preacher selection committee, it's the fact that we can't share those meetings with all of you. It is a blessing to be there. God's hand is upon us. We see God's hand upon us. How? How do you, how do you see it? Well, let's look at verse 2. God speaks first of his provisions. Green pastures, still waters, speaks to our inner being. They speak to our deepest need of knowing that we are known and that we are cared for. God provides those green pastures. God provides the still waters. And since he provides for our deepest needs, he will provide wisdom and discernment to our choices. Verse 3 speaks of God's pardon. He restores our soul and guides us in the paths of righteousness. He strengthens us when we're weak. He disciplines us when we fall. But he's always ready to forgive us. He treats us like a father treats his children. And in that thought that we are his children, we know that we have a father who loves us and wants his hand to be in our lives. Verse 5 speaks of God's protection. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Evil is all around us. Given the opportunity, those things can destroy us. Satan is stronger than you or I alone. But here's the idea of protection. We are not alone. Our Lord promises us what? He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Our Lord prepares a table of good things, regardless of the presence of evil. Verse 6 speaks of peace in our future. His goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The task before us is challenging right now. 
But we have a Father who sees our future. He knows those challenges. He's going to take care of them. We are privileged to know God, and that knowledge gives us confidence that goodness and mercy surround us now and that we will live in the presence of the Lord forever. We don't know what the future holds, but we do know who holds the future. So we have needs to place in God's hands, especially now, especially now. But Psalm 23 assures us that we have God's provisions, we have his pardon, we have his protection, and as a result of those three, we have his peace. The hand of the Almighty is upon us. The Lord is our shepherd. Would you join me in silent prayer, please? Let's pray together. Our Almighty Father, our glorified Savior, our Holy Spirit, we come before you knowing that you have told us you will protect us, you will guide us, and if we will allow your will into our lives, you will in turn glorify us. We ask, Father, that you put your hand upon us individually and as a congregation of your people here in Mesa so that we can bring glory to you. We ask that you do for us what you have done for your people all throughout history, to take our frail human lives, bring your power, your glory, and your will upon us, and do great things in your name and in your creation. We ask, Father, that you help us to have willing spirits, to follow your path, to let your mighty hand work upon us. And we ask these things through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our second area of focus is victory in prayer. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 through 12, the story is told there of Jehoshaphat. When three enemy nations teamed up against him, Jehoshaphat knew that there was no way he could overcome those kinds of odds. So he prayed. In verses 3 through 4, Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. From all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. In the interview phase of, of our work, it's been easy to feel surrounded. There are a lot of things going on. There are a lot of moving parts. When Jehoshaphat found himself surrounded, what did he do? He prayed to the Lord. In a busy time, it's, it's natural for us to start telling God what's going on and asking him for help. He wants us to talk to him. He wants to hear the things that are on our hearts. That's good. But let's not start our prayers by telling God what we need. Let's not start there. Notice the lessons that we can learn from how Jehoshaphat prays. 
First, remind yourself of God's greatness. In verse 6, Jehoshaphat prayed, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might, so none is able to withstand you. When we're praying for something that is beyond our sight, like looking for our next preacher, we need not focus on that issue first. Instead, let's focus on God's greatness. You see, the bigger and the greater and the more majestic God becomes in our minds, the smaller our issues become. Remind yourself of God's unlimited power. In verse 7, Did you not, our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? When we realize that God has all the power in heaven and on earth, and when we realize that he has always been faithful to that which he's promised, we can trust him. We know that. But when we pray, think of the ways that God has helped us in the past, whether it's as an individual or as our whole congregation. Think of the ways that God has helped us in the past. He's not going to stop now. The third thing that Jehoshaphat did, he prayed in reminding God of his promises. As we've already read in verse 7, Jehoshaphat reminded God that he promised Israel that the land would be theirs. God has made equally as important promises to us. They are even greater promises to us because we're not just talking about a land to occupy. Go ahead in your own minds, think about concluding the verse that I'm about to quote. And as you're doing that, think about the power that's involved. Think about the promise that's involved. Our Lord said, ask, and it will be given to you. He's not talking about the promised land. He's talking about things far greater than that. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. We're not talking about the promised land. Something far greater is being promised to us. Knock and it will be open to us. When Jesus walked on the earth, he often used God's own promises. There's a powerful lesson there. We should too. Fourth, ask God for his action. After Jehoshaphat prayed of God's greatness his unlimited power, and his promises. Then, then he asked God for his action. Jehoshaphat said of the attacking forces, look in verse 12. O oh, our God, will you not execute judgment on them? For we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. Look at this. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. End of the matter. So don't just ask God to bless your life. 
Jehoshaphat asked for something specific. God knows what's best for us, and he's, that's what he'll do. But he still wants to hear it from us. Focus on him. Focus on the specific thing that we need, and we'll see him provide, just as he did for Jehoshaphat and all people who have called upon his name. Long story short, God did it. Let's have a moment again of silent prayer, please. Would you bow with me, please? Lord, we ask you to be with us and that you would create in us a clean heart, O oh God, and that you renew our steadfast spirit within us, that you be with us as we are looking for a new man here to fulfill the pulpit here at this area. And Father, you help us to have that victory through prayer. And let us focus our minds on you. Father, after all, you are magnificent. You're great. You're powerful. And Father, it's in you that we ask all of these things. And Father, that the power that you have and the promises that you've promised us. And we know, Father, that these promises will not stop. And Lord, that you help us to remind you sometimes of your promises that we forget and things that we're supposed to be taken care of. And Father, that you help us and that you be with us during this selection process. Because Father, our prayer needs to be an action prayer. It needs to be a victory for, through prayer that we do this, that we find the man that we're looking for, for for this congregation. And Father, that you bless us in that area. And Father, that we, you not, we're, that we use the unlimited power of God and his promises that you be with this congregation that you grant us the wisdom in which we need to have. And Father, that, that you would grant us the victory that we need through prayer. And Father, it's in the precious and holy name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever felt that your prayers have gone unanswered? Our third area of focus is on that, unanswered prayer. The scripture reading is from Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God or respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice from my adversary. For a while, the judge refused. But afterward, he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, 
Or in some versions, it says, because of her importunity, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. Let's just jump up and down on verse 1. He told them a parable. Why? That they ought always to pray and not lose heart. When I was taught to swim, I learned all the stuff we were supposed to know over here in the three feet, the three foot end of the pool. But then in order to graduate from that course, we had to demonstrate all of that over in the 10 foot end of the pool. That involved trust. We have come so far in this transition process. And believe me, we are in the 10-foot end now. But that involves trust. God's seasons are not at our command. They're not at our whim. If the first strike of a match doesn't produce a fire, what do we do? We keep on striking it until it does. God hears prayer, but he may not answer it at the time that we, in our minds, have appointed for him to answer our prayers. God always reveals himself to the seeking heart, no doubt, but not always just when or where or how we've determined in our own expectations. There's a need for perseverance in our prayers. As the Bible says, because of her continual coming or because of her importunity, the judge did as this widow had asked. What does importunity mean? Rather than giving you a definition, let me give you an illustration of importunity. Think about all the telemarketers who call you. One after another after another. They just keep calling and calling and calling. That's importunity. That is an illustration of what Jesus says our prayers to him should be like. Keep calling and calling. See? See, shouldn't we be just as persistent in spiritual things as those folks are in seeking material things? Our need for God's guidance and his direction is upon us. Therefore, we're going to keep calling and calling. Let's never quit because our Father delays his reply. It's just time to strike the match again. As this slide says, I do not believe there is such a thing in the history of God's kingdom as a right prayer offered in the right spirit that is forever left unanswered. Would you join me in silent prayer, please? Please continue to pray with me. 
O Holy Father God, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end of all things in this world and this universe, Father, we raise up our voices, our hearts and spirits in prayer to you, Father. For, Father, we know truly from the examples of the Bible there are no such things as unanswered prayers. We remember Hannah as she prayed for her son who became the prophet Samuel, who led to the selection of David, Father. Her prayers were answered even though she was in distress, Father, and had many, many tears, Father. Remember King Hezekiah, Father, who had many trials himself, Father, and was told that he would die. But he cried unto you, Father, and you answered his prayers by adding 15 years to his life. In the New Testament, Father, even those who were not part of the kingdom yet, when Cornelius, who was just a good man at that time, before he was baptized, you answered his prayer, Father. He became part of the transition and the transformation of Peter, who would help usher in the kingdom and bring Saul to become one of the greatest apostles for you, Father, to bring us, the Gentiles, into the world, Father. So surely we know there's no such as unanswered prayer, Father. We know that you always answer prayer. Sometimes it's not now. Sometimes it's not yet. Sometimes it's not, this is not for you, Father. But always you answer our prayers, Father. You answer our prayers in ways that sometimes we can't even understand until we go through that storm. So for us, Father, it's to remember that our prayers will be answered. They'll be answered sometimes when we have to go through the crucible that will shape us and form us, Father, to get rid of the things that we don't need to have, Father, to make us better people. Sometimes it's just the prayer to understand that you have a message, Father, that when we go through this, you'll be glorified better in the end, Father, when we're faithful getting through those situations, Father. The only time you've mentioned to us that you will not answer our prayer, as mentioned in James 4, 3, is when we pray amiss and pray for things that are not about glorifying you, Father. So, Father, as we continue in this process of waiting for the man that you appointed for us, Father, as we patiently wait to be transformed, Father, to go through whatever you have for us, Father. Let's continue to be faithful that not only at this time, Father, but through all the situations that we have seen in this congregation, Father, and there are many, where we've seen your hand move and change things, Father. As we go into this new year, Father, as we go through the challenges of this time of life, Father, that our prayers will be answered, Father, faithfully, Father, that we just step back and be ready to glorify you, Father, when you do answer those prayers. Not only will you answer the prayers, but are we ready to glorify you when you have answered those prayers? and tell others, Father, so they can be used as a beacon to bring others to Christ, Father, and to glorify you until the end, until you call us home. So, Father, continue to give us faith, hope, and most of all, to the strong belief that you will answer all our prayers, Father, if we're just faithful to the end. And all those things that we ask, we just say amen. Our fourth area of focus, worry not. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth more than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. But I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the the grass of the field, which is today alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? The Gentiles seek after all of these things. And look at this. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. 
but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Therefore, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let verse 32 simmer for just a second. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. He knows who we are looking for, and he is preparing that man, even as we speak, not to worry. It's wise, it's okay, to make reasonable plans for the future, but we're good, I know I am, we're good at messing up today because we spend so much emotional energy regretting the past and worrying about the future. Jesus asks, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? This verse reminds us, and we need to be reminded, that worry has never changed a thing. It can't change our past. It can't change our future. It's just going to mess up today. Worry comes when we focus on our fears instead of trusting in our God. When we're worried, we're acting like orphans. We're acting like we don't have a heavenly father who promised to care for our needs. When worry is occupying our minds, let's face it, that our minds are not focused on the kingdom of God. Worrying is taking the place of our thoughts about our God. Food is so high, have you noticed? Gas is so high. Clothing is so high. Yeah. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Your heavenly Father knows what we need. So let's not worry. Would you join me in silent prayer, please? Join me in prayer. Father, you are holy and above all. All power and authority and truth belong to you. You have revealed yourself to us and revealed your purpose for us in your son and in your word. You are the rock of our salvation. Worry, fear, and anxiety are silenced by you. In your word, you tell us to cast our cares on you, to not be anxious, but by prayer and petition make our request known to you. By the spirit you seal us with, we call out to you as the perfect Father, Abba, who knows our needs and works all things for our better. Father, many of your people have been great examples to us in times of uncertainty and doubt. Their stories are remembered by us and are to give us hope and build our faith in you. Father, the story that uh, comes to mind is uh, Elisha's servant. When Elisha and his servant were surrounded by the enemy, Elisha could, uh, Elisha's servant could not see the victory, the chariots 
until his eyes were open. But Father, they were there, and you provided them, and you provided that victory. We hold to your timeless promises. We know that the battle is yours. We need simply to obey, to be strong and courageous, and to trust you with all our hearts. Father, you have given us a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. You have given us mission and purpose. You've gifted your people with talents and gifts to edify, serve, and grow. So for our part, let us replace any fear, worry, and anxiety with courage, conviction, and unity of purpose as we lay our plans before you as we seek a new minister. May integrity and uprightness protect us because our hope, Lord, is in you. And bless us as we seek and do your will. In Jesus' holy name, amen. I ask now that all of our shepherds, would you please come forward? Our shepherd, Kevin Hubby, is unable to join us this morning. He's at home recovering from an illness. But he's a part of what's going on here today, and he's been a part of our selection process all along. Get well soon, Kevin. As all of our shepherds now gather around, our shepherd uh, C.R. Gaines, who is our liaison between our preacher selection committee and all of our shepherds, is now going to call us to fast and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Brother Dave. Preacher Selection Committee developed a short overview of fasting, and it was included in the handout in last week's bulletin. If you haven't seen it, it was on this bright color paper, and it does a great job of recapping in the New Testament and the Old some examples and, of and the use of fasting as related to uh, the uh, Christians at that time. So if you haven't seen this, it's, I know it's available still on the back bulletin, uh, back, uh, I'm sorry, the front uh, greeting area, as well as online. I want to read the conclusion from this document with the examples that it gave and kind of, kind of read you the, uh, the end to help us understand what we're trying to accomplish this morning. Fasting can be associated with the work in the worship of the New Testament church. In fact, if you look at uh, Acts 14.23 and Matthew 16.16-18, 16, 16 you see, you see these, this whole topic of fasting mentioned. In fact, in Matthew 16, uh, in Matthew 16 uh, it is a it at least appears to be a foregone conclusion that people were fasting at that time as Jesus warns them, says, when you fast, then don't be like the um, hypocrites and, and, and have, the, you know, have the pain on your face uh, of, hey, you know, look at me. Because that's not the point. It's not look at me, it's look at the uh, Lord. So there's a clear example of it. Though it's not a command, we clearly see uh, uh, that there's a need for it in seeking God's direction in our, in our lives, and especially around important events. Uh, in the other a- example given in Acts 14, it, to- it was uh, used in the, in the context of the appointment of the elders and of the deacons. But we believe this is an important thing. Um, not that a new preacher solves everything, but it's certainly an important role within the local body as they minister to us, with us, uh, as we serve the Lord here. So it's certainly an important time to be uh, as diligent as we can be in searching for God's direction. So your shepherds are calling us all to fast during this time, um, seeking God's blessings upon uh, the selection process of the person that God has chosen for us. We, we, and we understand that some of you might not be able to, to participate for uh, different reasons, possibly dietary, and that's okay. Uh, but to those that can, we ask that you do so during, uh, during this time until the end of the preacher selection process. I'm not saying start today and don't stop till next year. I'm saying, I'm saying pick a time. And on that topic, uh, the, the time might be different. I, I, I know in the past, Susan and I tried this. Let's try this. That doesn't sound very well. Susan and I were wanted to, wanted to fast, and we picked a time that was good for us. It was until the sun went down. I, don't, I didn't think I could make it, frankly, all day. Um, just, to be very, just, to be very, just to be very frank with you. Uh, but maybe it's miss a meal. Maybe it's miss till the sun goes down. Maybe it's miss the, the, in, the in, 
entire day. But the point is to pick a time that works for you. And again, it's about focusing on the Lord. And when, those, and when, you, when you deprive yourself of something like that, it helps you focus a little bit. And it help, not only on, on the what, but the why. why. Why am I doing this? Well, it's because I'm deferring this physical thing so I can focus more on God and give him the glory. You need not uh, tell anyone about, about this commitment. There is no uh, sign-up sheet with different uh, uh, time slots. Uh, we ask you to make this between you and the, and the, and the, and the uh, Lord. And as uh, your elders in the preacher selection committee, we're asking you to add fasting to your life during this Im- Im- important time. Again, not about us. It's about seeking God's favor and his direction and his will on this important time um, in the Mesa Bodies time. Let's pray together. Father God, we call you holy and we lift your name up above all names. And Father, we recognize you and who you are and we praise you and we honor you. And Father, we're so thankful to be your children. Father, we're thankful that you love us and we're thankful that you've demonstrated that love and while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, we're so thankful that you, that you listen to us and you listen for us, Father, that you not only make time to hear us, but that you want to hear from us as we read from your word. We know this. And Father, we, we want to lay this at your feet this morning. Father, we're, we're your local body, and I know you know that. I'm just saying, Lord, that we're, we're trying to come together with an additional focus on you around this time, this, this time of season for us as we seek a new minister. And Father, we as your shepherds, we want to lead and to unite the body and, and, and encourage the body here to, to fast for this reason. For the reason, Father, not to look at how spiritual we are, Father, but to show how great that you are. And Father, we seek your guidance, we seek your will. Father, we're trying to listen and we're trying to read and we're trying to, to discern what you want us to do. So we, we open our hearts to you, Father. We open our wills and we, we submit to you. We ask you to please lead us. Father, it's all in an effort so that we as the body, at this local body, Father, that we're all involved in and part of, that we can be about your business, that we can be bringing more souls to your son's name, and, Father, that we can, we can work and labor for you as, we're, as we journey home to be with you someday. Father, please bless our efforts. Please bless the body here. And please, uh, please, Father, help us to discern your will for us. Father, we do all of this and we ask all of this through the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. 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 just want to say thank you to our shepherds for your work and for your example among us and most of all for your vision thank you so what do we take home number one that the hand of God is upon us Number two, that we have victory through prayer. Number three, there's no such thing as an unanswered prayer. And number four, there's no need to worry. Again, I ask you, what do you see? Do you see just a football? Or now do you see a reminder of what our prayers should be? Let's just remember that if we sew it up at both ends and all around with prayer, whatever the concern, whatever the need, it just cannot come apart in the middle. Would you pray with me, please? May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious upon us. 
And may you, Lord, lift your countenance upon us and give us peace. And the congregation can say, Amen. Amen. Our Creator calls to His creation. Come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our Lord wants to bless our lives. Jesus has, and he continues to do his part. There's a song we've sung before. I owed a debt that I could not pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. That's who is calling to us. We respond to him initially in three ways. First, there needs to be a change of our heart that is brought about by faith. There needs to be a change of our lives that is brought about by repentance. And then there needs to be a change of our relationship that is brought about by baptism. In Romans chapter 6, the Bible tells us that it is through baptism that we are raised to walk in the newness of life. Sometimes in walking in the newness of life, things get difficult, things are challenging. But folks, just look around you. There are 300 or 400 people here who are more than willing to help you in any way we possibly can. In just a minute, some of our shepherds are going to be here in front of us. If you have any needs at all, please make these things known as we stand and sing. In moments like these, I sing out a song. 